Okay, um, thank you everybody for joining me um, this afternoon. So I'll try to keep this um, as kind of concise as possible um, and try to hopefully answer some of your questions um, maybe before beforehand. Um, so what I just thought I'd want to do is just run through kind of some of the common points that we're asked about um, on open events um, and just to talk you through the structure of our programme, thinking about how our application system works, thinking about the course itself and placements, the logistics of studying in Birmingham, um, and then also just to consider things about funding. So funding often we're um, commonly asked about too, um, how our interviews work and how you go about applying for the programme. So I'll hopefully try to cover as much of that as possible. Um, but as, as we said, please do kind of um, ask any questions that you might have along the way. Um, so in terms of thinking about applying and where to apply to so I guess the first thing is it's great that you're considering a career um, as a physician associate so that's the first big thing um, and it's love it's always really nice to kind of see um, so many people that email attend open events in person and online that are interested in considering um, the career itself so it's really nice from my perspective to meet so many people that, that are considering the profession. Um, now, in terms of thinking about Birmingham, so of course we want you to come to Birmingham. Um, that's what everybody's going to say. Um, and I'm going to hopefully kind of talk you through kind of why you should come to Birmingham, um, talk about our recent national examination performance, um, and hopefully try to convince you that it should be um, us that you should come to. So I guess one thing to consider is that there has been a huge expansion of programmes across the UK. And I guess it's like with any programme um, in undergraduate or postgraduate programmes, they all differ and not just by location, but in terms of how the programme is actually structured. Now we offer two programmes. We offer the postgraduate diploma and we also offer a master's programme. So if I just talk you through each of those, a common question tends to be, what's the difference between the two? Is there any um, advantage of doing a master's over a PG dip, vice versa? So the postgraduate diploma, so if I start off with a postgraduate diploma. Um, so the postgraduate diploma is two years. So as other courses would be. So it's two years um, of training across general medicine and across specialties within the West Midlands. The one key difference between a postgraduate diploma versus the master's programmes is that in the postgraduate diploma, you don't have to undertake a research project and therefore you don't have to write a lengthy 15,000 word dissertation. So that's one thing. And I guess it's asking yourself, you know, are you at this point interested in research? What research would you be interested in doing? Um, do you have any ideas as to where you might want to kind of move your future career into? Because my kind of thing always tends to be that you want your research to be meaningful and you want it to add to your clinical practice, but also clinical practice of the you know, institution, the local community, the population that you're serving. And it can be really hard to know very early on exactly what you want to what you want to do. And I guess my key question I always tend to ask applicants as well is how much do you really want to do a research project in that two years? Because essentially undertaking a master's and a PG dip, the time scale is exactly the same. The only difference is that in the PG dip, you don't have to complete the project, research project in the masters you do. So something has to give. Um, and that's the way that I try to get people to, to kind of think about it. Something has to give somewhere. And if you're concentrating on undertaking research and writing a dissertation, 
that's going to be at the expense of time that you might be spent learning clinical medicine um, and practicing clinical skills, etc. So there always has to be, there always has to be something that gives. The only thing that gives with a postgraduate diploma currently is that unlike with master's programs, it doesn't receive funding from the student loans company. But I will come on to HEE, so Health Education England um, funding um, in, in a short while. But I guess you just, I guess that's the key thing in terms of what you're thinking, you know, is a postgraduate, is it a postgraduate diploma or a master's that, I'm, uh, that I want to do? Um, and I guess the key question is how much do you want to go into research? And if the answer is not really, then the postgraduate diploma is probably better for you. In terms of employability, it makes absolutely no difference. So on completion of a postgraduate diploma, you still have to undertake the national exam in order to work as a qualified physician associate in the same way that uh, say a candidate that's undertaken a master's would have to do. But in terms of whether it's looked upon more favorably, if, uh, if an applicant has undertaken a master's as opposed to a postgraduate diploma, it doesn't. And actually all our graduates um, all receive jobs um, within the local region having undertaken postgraduate diplomas. Um, and so, so from that perspective, it's not something that you would need to worry about, um, given the expansion of jobs as well that are being created, not just locally, but also nationally. So it's important to think about that. And it's not just important, like I say, to think about what kind of programme you want to do, but also to think about where you want where you want to be. And our course, as all courses, um, are very much off in line with the kind of curriculum that's set out by the Faculty of Physician Associates. And certainly if you haven't come across um, the website, um, then I certainly would encourage you would encourage you to it contains a lot of information about the different courses about the actual profession itself um, and anything that's new and upcoming in the profession which is also very useful um, particularly if you're thinking about app applying and, um, and interviews so it's always good to keep a, a fresh um, and a float of kind of current issues that are affecting the profession itself so I guess that's the first thing to to think about and in terms of these further questions so hopefully I'll have answered some of them but um, if I'll try to kind of do my best to to hopefully kind of make it clearer with the others so are there any funding is there any funding support for students so as I mentioned with regards to the PG DIP um, so postgraduate diploma um, Unfortunately, there is no funding available from student loans company. That said, so every year so far, Health Education England have provided students with a um, £2,500 a year bursary that is that goes towards fees, whether that be accommodation, whether that be transport for placement, it's your money to use and you get 100% of that money that comes from Health Education England. I'm aware of other institutions may not necessarily give their students the full 100% of that funding, um, but certainly all the money goes toward, all that money that's received goes straight to the students. Um, so it's, it's, it goes a little way to try to help you with regards to kind of costs of living, transport and getting to placement. Um, with regards to the master's top up, sorry, I didn't mention. So the master's top up is, I guess, as I mentioned, it's a top up essentially. So in order for you to do the master's program here at Birmingham, it would have required you to have done the postgraduate diploma first. And again, the way that you, you could think about it is let's presume that you decide to go for the PG dip. Brilliant. You complete the postgraduate diploma, you finish and you successfully pass your national exam and you decide that you're going to work in cardiology. Brilliant. So what you can be doing is you can be working as a cardio uh, cardiology physician associate. You can be earning money whilst you're doing so. And that can help provide 
kind of funding support then for your masters. So it allows you to complete your research whilst you're working at the same time. And it also allows you that time, as I mentioned at the very beginning, to think about what you want to do your research in, in order for it to be meaningful and for it to have an actual impact on your clinical practice and the population that you want your research project to serve. So, um, <clears throat> so that's hopefully kind of cleared up about funding. And there are other initiatives that also provide kind of funding opportunities for um, students um, that are accessed kind of outside of the institution and outside of kind of government um, higher education loans. In terms of thinking about who we are on our team, so we have a mix of academics. So some of us are um, full time in academia. So um, some of us kind of mix our time between working clinically and working at um, Birmingham University. Um, and again, in terms of the mix of clinical skills, again, it's it's, it's varied. So. I would say the majority of our teaching staff are practicing physician associates, most of which actually trained and qualified in Birmingham. Um, we also have the current um, FPA president um, on our teaching faculty, who will soon be the course director. Um, and so, um, so it's quite advantageous from that perspective, because again, we are, we can keep afresh with changes within the profession and then we can filter that down to our students. Um, myself um, and a couple of other colleagues, so we're not physician associates, we are um, medical doctors um, that have been training physician associates for many years. Um, so you get a, a slightly different perspective, um, but all in all, it's a nice mix of different skill sets and each of us brings our own expertise in different clinical areas. So you know that when you're undertaking, let's say, paediatrics, for example, you have a member of the teaching faculty that actually works in paediatrics and has had extensive experience working in peds. Okay. Um, in terms of thinking about the structure of the week um, and how many lectures we have, how many um, clinical skills sessions that we have. So if I just kind of show you um, the next couple of slides, so I'll just brush over this one. So this is the teaching team. As you can see, there's a there's a big mix of different clinical skill sets. One thing that we are bringing in, um, we've got Dr. Carly Nath as part of our um, program faculty, um, and she leads anatomy. And one thing that we are doing, and that Dr. Nath is doing, is she's leading anatomy and undertaking ultrasound sessions um, using the anatomage table and using the prosectorium facilities within the university in order to develop um, and deliver anatomy teaching. So it means that you can apply your theoretical knowledge into a more practical setting. And that's been really well received and certainly our kind of the plan to move into the anatomy labs within the medical school is starting as of September this year. So that's something new that's been integrated into the programme. So this is essentially kind of how the course is structured. I'll come on to the structure of the week in a second, but you can see this very kind of um, brief outline of how it's organised in terms of modules, number of credits per module, and the clinical themes that are incorporated into those. So for example, our current first year cohort that started in September, they've just finished their clinical placement. So they've undertaken all of these 16 weeks of clinical placement in their secondary care centres and some tertiary care settings. And they've come back to us now, we're into term three. Um, and so essentially term three is where we consolidate the knowledge that they've acquired in the first two terms, um, in addition to adding in therapeutics, virtual simulation, virtual ward round practice, public health, for example. But you can see kind of roughly how the course is laid out. So, you know, when you start the programme, we start very 
um, generic with kind of general medicine. You also are introduced to clinical skills from the very first week and we start clinical placement in the first term. So you start to get clinical placements in general practice um, in term number one. Term two is our extended um, hospital placement and term three, as I mentioned, is the consolidation period. And again, you will undertake placements in general practice in term three. So unlike some courses, again, it's coming back to thinking about what type of course you want to go um, or you would potentially be thinking about, we offer an integrated approach and therefore we not only integrate clinical uh, kind of theoretical um, knowledge and learning, but we incorporate that with clinical placement so that you can see what you're learning in a more practical, clinically orientated um, setting. The second year is devoted um, to specialties okay so you'll be undertaking specialties in psychiatry um, obstetrics and gynecology pediatrics surgery acute medicine accident and emergency um, in addition to kind of uh, honing in your pharmacology and therapeutics um, skills so the two years have a very distinctive kind of um, kind of uh, kind of Met set up. Year one's predominantly kind of gen med, year two being more focused on specialty medicine. Um, and this is just an example of what a typical week would look like. So as with all courses, irrespective of wherever you are, we'll always tell you that it requires a lot of hard work, it requires a lot of hours um, of self-directed study in addition to kind of attendance at face-to-face um, -face kind of teaching um, sessions and making sure that you undertake the required number of hours um, for clinical placement that the FPA set. But if I just give you an example of say how the first term um, and how a week might look like, each week is structured around uh, a particular system. So for example, this is an example of kind of a GI um, slash kind of um, kind of neuro week. So there's two different kind of weeks that I've got here um, back to back. Essentially what tends to happen is each week you'll have a PBL um, session. So we are problem-based learning um, and the majority of our learning is done via PBL. Um, so you'll have your weekly PBL session with your tutor. You'll have an assigned PBL tutor and that tutor will remain consistent throughout the term. You will have communication sessions where you practice taking the cardiovascular histories, GI histories, etc. So you'll have introductory sessions for those and then you have the practical um, uh, practical whereby you're able to practice those skills using our role players and our associate clinical educators and I'll just come I'll come back to those um, in a minute. Um, you tend to find that Wednesdays are your anatomy day. Um, so for the most part, you'd be with um, Carly, um, Dr. Nath on Wednesdays, undertaking your anatomy teaching. Um, and that tends to be kind of across the morning um, into the early afternoon with a break in between. And then towards the end of the week, again, as I mentioned, you may well have certain um, skills so GI history taking for example uh, took place on a Wednesday and a Thursday of this particular week um, and then there may be special skills that may be integrated so for example we're doing a GI week so therefore it makes sense that say a PR exam would come in so again you're having kind of clinical um, uh, examination sessions throughout. Friday tends to be our clinical examination days and by that everybody um, within the cohort comes together to practice on our um, associate clinical educators um, on the examination of the week essentially. So for example for this week you would be practicing your gastrointestinal examination skills. Um, and the beauty of doing it together is that 
all of the cohort, so the whole cohort are together with the academic team, and we essentially kind of work around each of the groups um, in order to make sure that you're competent and you feel confident in your examinations before you go on to clinical placement. One thing that we do have at Birmingham, so I've mentioned the associate clinical educators, you may well have read about those on the website. Um, our ACE team are absolutely brilliant. So the ACEs are specifically trained in clinical history and clinical examinations, some also in um, more specific examinations. So for example, male genitalia, female uh, genitalia examinations. But our, our associate clinical educators um, will guide you through the Friday afternoons and during your communication skill sessions. And they uh, it gives you the opportunity to be able to practice your examination skills on real patients. And the other thing that the ACEs can do is they can mimic clinical signs and they can mimic clinical scenarios so that you can start to put your learning from earlier on in the week into a more clinical context. So hopefully that just gives you a, a brief kind of outline of each week. And that's very much kind of standard for the whole of the first term. So that's what would happen kind of from September through um, to the new year, after which you would then commence your secondary care placements. Oh, sorry. Um, just a, a quick question on placements, uh, just before I move on to application, just whilst I've mentioned it. With regards to clinical placements, again, it's a question that we get asked quite a lot about where the clinical placements are um, and do is there any choice in where um, students go for placement? So I guess the first question, so in answer to the first question, we try to kind of provide placements across the West Midlands. So we've provide placements in, um, my mind's gone blank now, Dudley, so Russell's Hall, sorry, I went, my mind went blank there, Wolverhampton, um, Dud, um, yeah, Dudley, I've mentioned Russell's Hall, Shrewsbury, Telford, um, Coventry, um, Nuneaton, George Eliot. Um, the furthest our placements have tended to extend are Kettering and Northampton. Um, but where possible, um, Kate, who is our placement lead, if you've been allocated a placement kind of further away um, for one of your placements, will then try to allocate your placement nearer to Birmingham um, for your subsequent placement. So we also have access to placements at Birmingham. Um, I guess it's important to mention that we are based in Birmingham and we have a big hospital sat next to the medical school um, where our students will also undertake clinical placements. Um, in terms of preference, so students are always asked at the beginning of the programme if they um, require any special kind of considerations with regards to placements. Um, and that may well be because of kind of family commitments, et cetera. And those are submitted kind of at the beginning so that it's clear in terms of any um, kind of requirements that are needed um, with regards to kind of where you're allocated for placement. And they are very much kind of assessed on a case by case basis. And that's not to say that they're all um, guaranteed, but you are given the opportunity to submit a special request um, uh, for placement preferences. Um, I guess the last thing to just quickly mention and talk about is the application process. So, and again, I get a lot of questions about, you know, is my degree relevant? What are you looking for? What about the personal statement? How do the interviews work? So we, as of this year, we moved to UCAS. So it used to be done via um, the UOB kind of um, SITS portal, but we've now um, moved across to UCAS. Um, and kind of this is just a very brief kind of overview of kind of what essentially happens. You kind of you submit your, your UCAS application. We will kind of 
um, assess your UCAS application based on your undergraduate degree, the academic grades that you've um, acquired essentially throughout your education. We'll look at your personal statement, we'll look at your um, kind of clinical experience, any work experience, volunteering um, that might be applicable. And then if you're kind of um, shortlisted or kind of listed to the kind of you moved on to the next stage, you will be invited to attend an interview and that is a uh, MMI. So we and then we took we ran our first round of um, MMI um, interviews this year, um, just before Easter, which were um, which were kind of ran very successfully um, and consisted of three stations. So it mentions here four stations plus a written exercise. In this case, it was a three station um, MMI. Um, but we are planning to adjust that for subsequent um, cohorts. So we are planning to um, run a, a five station MMI, but maybe remove the written part of the exercise. And certainly we remove the written exercise for this last application round. Um, and then from there, depending on how you perform in your interview, um, you'll be offered um, hopefully a conditional um, offer. Um, and then that's very much on obtaining academic grades and also um, fulfilling our non-academic criteria. So, yeah, so UCAS, UCAS is the um, um, application portal that we're now using for our um, PG dip and for our masters. Oh, sorry, everybody, I'm going the wrong way now. Um, so in our intake for September 2022 is closed. Our applicant round has now been completed. All of our offers have been sent out um, and all of our MMI interviews have been completed. So the next round will be for September 2023. And when that opens is to be confirmed, but it based on experience from this last um, round, it was around September that the um, uh, the application um, round opened and it closed at the end of January. So it'd be the latter half of the year that I would anticipate that UCAS will then reopen the application window. So the academic criteria is as um, as outlined here. Um, so ideally, we're looking for candidates that have achieved a first or a two one in a life sciences, biological, biomedical based um, undergraduate degree. I guess the key thing just to emphasise is that what we are looking for, pretty much as all courses we look, would look for, is to have that fundamental um, grounding in kind of biological life sciences purely because like I mentioned it's it's a two-year program it's intense and therefore the opportunity to run through those kind of basic life biomedical science subjects that would be covered say in undergraduate medicine for example at the very beginning there's simply not the time to do that you're kind of thrust straight into clinical medicine and so therefore if you don't have that grounding um, it, it's it's going to be difficult to be able to kind of catch up and keep up um, with those that have got that background um, so that's essentially kind of what we're looking for and the list of kind of applicable subjects on the website is by no means exhaustive. Um, I get lots of emails asking about whether certain degrees are relevant or not. Sometimes if it's something that maybe we've if not kind of necessarily come across, I tend to ask you for your um, academic kind of transcript, and the modules, just so that we can assess that under kind of that kind of baseline level of kind of physiological um, and biomed um, uh, content. We mentioned here about 2-2 may be considered, um, may be considered on the proviso that you have kind of at least kind of six months or so of kind of clinical 
um, or healthcare um, related work experience in order to try to supplement um, your academic um, undergraduate degree. We have and we do accept candidates that have had a um, healthcare professional qualification. Um, so we have um, uh, students that have undertaken nursing previously, um, audiologists, podiatrists, um, optometrists, um, radiographers. So it, it can be varied. And what I would say is that if you do have any queries regarding your undergraduate degree, that it's much better to ask and just be sure. Um, before submitting an application. Um, we ask for two references. The UCAS application will only ask for one as part of the um, application process itself. And then we will also ask for a second reference, one of which ideally should be from your current academic institution, um, if possible. If, however, that's not possible because, say, for example, you completed your degree a few years ago and you're now working, then, of course, an occupational um, reference will be um, sufficient because we understand that actually um, academics might move on um, and your personal tutor that you may have had in your programme may not necessarily be there anymore. So it's very much dependent on the circumstances, but ideally it should be an academic reference. Um, international qualifications um, are considered and our central admissions team um, are brilliant in kind of helping me with regards to um, kind of working out the equivalent. So essentially what they will do is they will kind of take your um, university degree and convert it to say the UK equivalent with regards to whether it's a first or two, one or two, two. So they make my life much, much easier. Um, and with regards to the English language requirement, it's, it's on the website with regards to the IELTS um, scoring system that's required um, with regards to the conditions um, regarding kind of English language. Um, again, kind of if I don't have sufficient background in my life or kind of biomedical sciences, again, it's kind of look at your degree transcript and think about the modules that you're undertaking. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, we're likely to ask for an academic transcript. Um, and if we don't think that there's enough, say, biomedical, physiological, life science content, then um, there are kind of top up modules that are available um, to try to help supplement that because like I say, because there isn't the time on programmes to be able to cover that at the very beginning, um, there's simply no uh, way to be able to kind of provide, provide that um, teaching at the very start. So therefore, you need to have that foundation before you begin. Um, we don't consider applications from candidates that have previously undertaken a medical degree or um, have failed to progress or concerns have been raised um, in other kind of healthcare um, related courses. And certainly we will ask you to declare if you've been enrolled in a PA course elsewhere. And much that I've mentioned about it being kind of an expansive programme and that there's been an expansive expansive national programs it still is a very kind of tight-knit community so we do tend to um, be aware of um, students that may have been unsuccessful in one program that are applying in other institutions so um, it's always best to be honest about these things rather than to be found out um, in terms of qualities essentially you'll see this all over if you type in google for what you know, qualities are looked for in healthcare, um, it, whether that be in medicine, physician associate studies, nursing, anything kind of clinically orientated, you, you'll come across the same competencies. And these competencies are essentially what we're trying to assess as part of our MMIs. We try to see, you know, how good you are at talking to people, how good you are at problem solving, you know, your ability to kind of critically analyse information, form balanced arguments? Are you aware of kind of current 
changes and current issues within the healthcare um, system and within the kind of NHS. So these are all kind of very common qualities that you would see um, irrespective of kind of wherever you, wherever you looked. But certainly it's something that we look for as part of our MMIs and that's what our candidates are assessed for as part of those MMIs. And US, the, the way that you evidence that um, is straightforward through your application form, but that only gives a certain indication of you as a person it's much better to be able to meet you and be able to speak to you um, and so therefore um, we invite you to interview and to be able to assess that further things that we look for on a personal statement so really common question you know thinking oh gosh what should I include you know what about my work experience I found it really difficult to be able to get work experience in light of covid so key things so I guess what we're looking for is that you've considered the career and you've got insight into what it involves. You, you appear to be motivated towards um, PA as your kind of future um, career um, and that you've got evidence to be able to support that. And that may well be that you've um, been fortunate enough to shadow PAs. You may have spoken to PAs as part of open events. If you attend kind of open events so the last um open event that we ran i kind of stood um and had some of our current students with us so it's quite useful to be able to kind of speak to kind of current students um previous students that are now qualified and working clinically just to get a good idea as to what the career actually involves um, and you're aware about the um, kind of course itself. Um, with regards to work experience, so ideally, if you can, kind of clinical experience with a PA is great if you can um, secure that because, you know, we're, I wouldn't be so kind of naive to think that we can all kind of secure that because there's only a finite number of um, qualified PAs compared to applicants and so actually people worry because they think well I haven't had you know six 12 months of working in a hospital or shadowing shadowing a PA and whilst that's advantageous it's not the be all and end all and I guess what I want to just try to convey is that even if your work experience isn't necessarily within the healthcare setting, and certainly it has been a lot more difficult to be able to get healthcare experience um, in the pandemic, the key thing with work experience is it is your reflection. It's your reflection of what it has kind of taught you and what it will enable you to do kind of moving forwards, because it's all about transferable skills. Um, and communication skills, problem solving, being able to deal with uncertainty. You don't necessarily have to have, you know, seen or demonstrate in a healthcare environment to be able to say that you can do those things. They can be demonstrated outside of healthcare. Um, and the key thing is kind of your reflection of that. So don't worry if you don't necessarily have clinically orientated experience. Think about those transferable skills. That's the key thing. Um, and I've just put a couple of things on here. So step into the NHS, do it. They're useful um, websites um, for kind of helping to kind of put you in touch with local voluntary um, kind of community based projects, work experience. Um, so they're, they're worth a, well, they're worth a look and it's reflection reflection is the key is the key thing um okay um in terms of afterwards so i won't dwell too much on this it's reviewed by myself um and my colleagues we will then kind of look to see do you fulfill the um criteria that we've laid out beforehand and if so you'll be invited to a mmi
Okay. And our MMIs, so this year that, like I say, they were ran in April, we're aiming to do the same next year. So for September, 2023, we will be running our MMIs again in April. Um, things to speed up the process is more just making sure that you've got everything on a UCAS application form. So if you are um, wanting to apply, hopefully, yes, you will. Um, it's, it's easier. It makes my job much easier if you have your academic um, transcript with your current or your marks to date on. Um, you've written your personal statement and you've managed to get your academic reference. Um, rather than us having to keep chasing you because it just delays the process. Um, and then these are more your non-academic conditions. So um, people ask about what are the non-academic conditions? Why is my offer only conditional? And it's just conditional based on you kind of completing your health declaration, DBS, having your occupational health screening, um, uh, completed before you start the program in September. So in terms of kind of further information, there's the link um, and there's the website that um, gives you further information on the actual programme um, itself. Um, and also we've got our PA admissions um, uh, email. So it's PA admissions at contacts.com ham.ac.uk it's on the website so that should you have any questions about whether it be you know personal statement based academic requirements I'm not sure about my modules you can ask you can ask any further questions any further questions there um, and that's it thank you very much